Welcome back. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London. My name is Brendan Cole. Egypt's foreign minister has become the latest member of Mohamed Morsi's government to resign. At least five other ministers have resigned since Sunday's mass protests, which saw hundreds of thousands of people take to the streets. The head of Egypt's armed forces has threatened direct military involvement if the demands of the people are not met. But the president, Mohamed Morsi's aides, indicated he would not give in to the threat of any military coup. But a year on from Mohamed Morsi's elections, what hope is there for democracy to take hold in Egypt? And what does it mean for the Arab Spring more widely? Well, to discuss this, I'm pleased to be joined in the studio by Shadi Lewis. He is a writer for the El Modon newspaper. Also here is Emily Dyer. She's a researcher from the Henry Jackson Society. On the line from Cairo, we have Mawa Farid. She's a pro-democracy activist and protester. Also in the Egyptian capital is Angus Blair. He's the founder of the Signet Institute, which analyzes the Middle East and North Africa. And on the line from the US, from Dallas, is Mohammed Al-Bayari, who's a security advisor. Um, I'll turn to you, Angus Blair. You're in Cairo. I mean, what's the mood in Cairo like at the moment? Well, yesterday was almost euphoric in terms of the general population that had been out on demonstrations two days ago, dampened somewhat very late at night by the president's announcement that he was not really going to play ball with the military. Today's fine. A lot of people were back at work. It was a bank holiday yesterday. A lot of people back at work today. So it's quite difficult to determine the, the daily mood of everyone. And we don't want to get involved too much in what the Twitterverse says or something like that. But I think it depends where you are, if you're pro Mursi and Muslim Brotherhood or if you're not. So it's quite a, still a divided society. Mawa Farid, this wasn't how the Arab Spring was supposed to turn out, was it? No, actually. We, we thought it would be only one revolution and then we have democracy established and then the, the transitional process would go fine and everything else. And then we have a strong government and economic improvement and so on and so forth. But apparently it just didn't happen. I don't know, is it, is it due to lack of experience or is it because we selected the wrong president and the wrong ruling party? Right now, what I'm seeing in the streets, I think we are back on the right track. But, uh, I mean, part of the protests when the initial revolution was, ush- was ushered in was uh, the overreaching arm of the military. You can't, it can't be terribly good hoping that the military is going to get you out of this situation again. I'm one of the people that didn't want to come to the military at the end, but if it's going to be the military, that would bring it to an end and, uh, and force Morsi to, to step down because they are siding with the people and not because they are doing that on their own, then why not? But I do not want to see the military in power again. I do not want to see them governing the country. I just want them to end this rule and then other people uh, would take. Uh, the, the, the control of the country. Mohamed Morsi was democratically elected. He did have a mandate. And given that he was the first civilian leader in Egypt's history, one year is certainly not long enough to know whether or not he's going to be an effective president. There are always signs. And, you know, everything started to fall into pieces. The date on which he adopted this constitutional declaration that we viewed as a, a power grab giving himself unlimited powers and he's no longer accountable to anyone, not even before the people or the judiciary or even the parliament. And not only that, I mean, throughout the past year, at least we could have seen some signs that he is going on the right track and that he's adopting a number of policies that would help improve the economy, create more jobs, uh, create establish stability and provide security for the people. But this never happened. I mean, we've waited and waited and waited. He... All what he cared about is bringing his own people into the senior positions in the state. Uh, Okay, but uh, in a democracy, at the end of his mandate, he can be voted out. And isn't this part of being a grown-up nation, a grown-up democracy here in the United Kingdom, where coalition promises are are broken all the time, but but we wait till the end of the the tenure, and then we vote them out? Exactly, but in in UK, you've got separation of powers, and you've got each, each authority accountable before the other. In Egypt, we don't have this. We have a judiciary that is unable to hold anyone accountable, not, not the executive authority, nor even the other authority, the legislative authority. We've got a legislative authority that is enacting laws and not taking into account the implications in the future, not holding the president accountable because they are Islamists and they are trying just to bag the president, which is an executive authority. So we, we've got this issue of separation of powers and uh, no one is accountable before anyone else. And this is not good for a democracy. And this is not a democracy. And democracy is not just about the ballot box. 
It's about what people want. It's about getting accountability. It's about transparency. And it's about policies. Yes, policies might be wrong. And if they are wrong, then you need to listen to other people. You need to be more inclusive in the decision-making process. It's not that we are holding him accountable for one or two policy, wrong policies that he, uh, he formulated. We are just tired of the ongoing wrong uh, decision making uh, for the past year. Okay, well, I'll turn to my guest in the studio, Shadi Lewis, writer for El Modern newspaper. There were 24 marches against him not not long after he came into power, but um, it's almost like people wanted him to fail. Would Um, you agree with that? No, I don't think so. I mean, he was elected with uh, only 53%. Um, He reached power when the whole nation was completely divided. And he was able only to rule this country if he reached a consensus between all parties involved but he refused to do that. He even lost the support of the Salafist parties, uh, lost the support of the Noor party, which today announced that they are not supporting the president in this way, and they asked him to call for an election. He just uh, had a lot of conflict with the media, artists, intellectual, uh, the army, the police, secularists, every single sector in the society. He entrenched the the sectarian feelings among the country against Coptic, Shia, and everybody else. So he, people didn't want him to fail, but he failed himself. You're listening to The Voice of Russia in London with me, Brendan Cole. We're discussing the protests in Egypt. With me in the studio, Shadi Lewis, a writer for El Modon newspaper, Emily Dyer, researcher from the Henry Jackson Society. On the line from Cairo, Mawa Farid, a pro-democracy activist. Also in Egypt, we have Angus Blair, founder of the Signet Institute. And on the line from Dallas, Mohammed Al-Biari, a security advisor. Emily Dyer, this was always the the danger, wasn't it? It was almost the, the institutions weren't in place for a functioning democracy and it was fundamentally flawed or fatally flawed right from the start and that power grab that he that, that was mentioned was inevitable and, and the failure of the first year of his tenure as president was inevitable. Would you agree with that? I, th- I would agree with that to an extent. However, he could have gone in a direction that would have brought about progress um, and a greater step towards true democracy. However, he actually went in the opposite direction. So the promises that he made, the claims that he made that he was standing side by side with the revolutionaries turned out to be completely wrong. The promises that he made in order to get elected, he he didn't meet. He's actually gone in, in some ways the other direction. So the problems that existed um, under Mubarak are still there, and in some in some cases, the issues have actually got worse. Mohammed Al Bayiri in the United States, he, he gave a speech. Uh, Morsi did last week. It went on for about two and a half hours. He actually admitted that he made some mistakes. Have there been some successes in his year as president? Well, his supporters would definitely point to multiple successes, but I think they're overshadowed in the eyes of the majority of the population because of the wide discontent that you're currently witnessing across the Egyptian electorate. What about the calls for him to stand down? I mean, is there a way for him to actually stay in power but come to some kind of compromise that may satisfy the opposition? Well, the silver lining in all the transition negotiations, the formal ones uh, where uh, lately the opposition... Um, has kind of um, the organized political opposition plus the direct democracy activists in the rebel movement uh, that drove the petition and the large crowds uh, have kind of coalesced around a spokesman. So there's at least the ability to kind of negotiate, and then you have arbiters like the military as well as the United States government that are trying to um, get them both around the table, but we can hope that a breakthrough will happen soon, but it's going to come down to Mohamed Morsi and the negotiator, probably Mohamed al Mawa Farid in Cairo. The ultimatum by the army seemed to be hailed by the crowd, the, the hundreds of thousands present, as some kind of victory. Why do you think that is? Because probably people now have more confidence and more faith in the army and want to be army and the Ministry of of Interior side with the people and there is no one else backing the president and his cabinet. So for the people, this seems to be the ultimate solution. So the army now is the one that would take care of the people of Egypt. So that's that's why probably everyone was celebrating yesterday because they thought it's it's a done deal. 
I mean, these after 48 hours, there will be no President Morsi anymore. Angus Blair, what about the opposition? Do they have a clear plan? And should they be trying to win seats at a local level and, and tackle the Muslim Brotherhood politically as well as in the street? Nobody in the body politic in Egypt has a clear plan on, on anything. And that's a great disappointment. And obviously all of them are going to have to learn very quickly to have a strategy and a, and a program for the populace and for citizens to read. The opposition have been making some inroads. Remember that it's, it's relatively new under President Mubarak. There wasn't really a formal, big, organized opposition with the exception of the Muslim Brotherhood. And as a result, they're having to learn and learn quickly. And it's a very big country. It's 80 mil- 80 over, over 80 million people. And geographically, it's quite large. So to organize in two years is quite a feat. It can be done. I think they could have gone further, could do more. And I think that in the current situation, if they have any sense, they would become better organized at a grassroots level. Looking at what they're doing, I have to say I'm disappointed. I find them rather immature in terms of their lack of planning and organization. Um, But you can look at the strengths, say, of the Tamroid campaign, which has been efficient, which has garnered many, many, many millions of signatures and organized getting people in the street. The question is, then, what next? There's no plan. And quite frankly, I think that's the great weakness in the opposition, is that there's no real platform yet for the economy, for social programs. That's where I think they could try to win over more people if they became more positive, better planned, and more efficient as a political force. But you have to also note, it's a very diverse opposition. And many of them are are at odds and many different factors. The only combining factor that brings them together is opposition to the president and the Muslim Brotherhood. Shadi Lewis, can I get your response to that? The opposition is unorganized. It has no economic or any other kind of plan. The only thing they're unified in is opposition to Morsi. I completely agree with that. Uh, sadly, as a Egyptian Salvation um, Front, which represents uh, opposition at the moment, has no plan or program for the future. As well, they have completely contradictive uh, interest and agendas and I'm really worried about the future because of that because the failure wasn't only on the level of the regime as well on the level of the opposition. Marwa Ferry, just back to you. Um, Shadi Lewis says he's pessimistic about the future but there was a lot of optimism in Tahrir Square. Hundreds of thousands of people cheering and, and really confident that change can happen and change can happen for the good. Yes, that's true. I mean, I, I would agree with uh, with Shadi though. The, the opposition has not presented any uh, alternative plan for the economy or for how that political process will go forward. When I spoke to some of them, some of the of the members of the opposition, they actually said they have a plan, but they will not disclose it now. So I'm a bit skeptic about how efficient it would be. But in the streets, I mean, people in the streets are cheering and very happy, not because they know that the future might bring something better, but it's just because of a short-term goal that will be achieved soon, which is to say that Morty gone, but they I don't think that they actually have in mind what would happen next. Listening to the military statement yesterday saying that the military has a roadmap uh, with specific measures and procedures and it would uh, involve all parties in the implementation thereof also worries me because this roadmap is not disclosed publicly. So we're, we're all anticipating and all waiting for, for someone to present a solid plan that would take this country forward. Uh, Mohammed Ali Biari, are you confident that there can be some kind of concrete roadmap for the opposition? Unfortunately, no. At the moment, there is a um, almost a supermajority feeling, a big unity feeling in the opposition camp because they have one single focal point of the removal of uh, President Morsi. But that is not a program. I think that they're also, a lot of their positions are absolutist. So you're asking for not just President Morsi, but his Freedom and Justice Party and the wider Muslim Brotherhood and their supporters to accept the removal of the only symbol that they currently have after four election cycles. Then there, it makes it hard for that other camp to negotiate. Plus there's some demands for change in the Constitution to bring it back to where religious-oriented political parties cannot participate. So it makes the, the folks in power at the moment 
feel like they are facing an absolutist. Emily Dyer, how does the international community respond to this? Barack Obama has said there needs to be a political solution. This is a very difficult situation for the West, uh, in particular the US. Um, They want to see the democratization of the region. They don't want to come out against a man who's been democratically elected. That would undermine any kind of cause, certainly in neighbouring Libya, in particular in Syria, or name your country caught up in the Arab Spring. What, what, what would the US position be? What would they do? What, what, how, what are they going to say? How are they going to approach this? Well, at the moment, it's unclear. All we know is that Obama has come out and made a statement which is, to an extent, a bit further in the right direction, where he said that um, his initial position wasn't any commitment to a party in particular, but it was to the democratic process and that he still is continuing to support this democratic process and that's why he's uh, phoned President Morsi and asked him to uh, give in to some of the opposition's demands. However, I I don't know, I... So far, he hasn't really come out with any strong um, position pro or against uh, the Muslim Brotherhood or President Morsi. More broadly, do you think that perhaps there is, it feels like there's this revolutionary fervour that has swept up uh, the people of Egypt now and they see that they had success last time and this time they, could, they feel that they can have some kind of success. The West's approach to it will have to be, well, look, he was an elected man. You have to follow out the mandate. This is, this is what's called democracy. I think... Uh, it, the West is divided. You have people that sympathise with the opposition and, um, you know, they see 33 million people out protesting uh, what they consider to be an illegitimate government, an illegitimate political party, and they sympathise with that and want uh, the opposition to push through their demands. However, you also see people who want stability in the Middle East and they see that, that they, they believe that a Morsi government would be the best road to achieving that in terms of economic policies, in terms of political political developments, uh, for example, negotiations with the IMF. However, many this, for example, the policies with the IMF ra- uh, raising the food and fuel prices in order to um, put through a negotiation has been very unpopular with the Egyptian people. Angus Blair, th- that's been unpopular with the Egyptian people. That's um, the IMF, that's part of the Washington consensus. This is US-driven uh, part of the hardship of Egypt. Yeah, the IMF is not demanding anything. I mean, I saw them, saw them in December, saw them again a few weeks ago in Washington, met the liaison officer recently. They are not demanding anything. What they are wanting is an, is an economic plan, and that's up to Egypt as to how to handle its finances. The IMF, like the World Bank and other international organizations, are dealing with taxpayers' money, and they need to see plans. They're not enforcing hardships on Egypt. The IMF of the 1980s and 90s it's a, uh, has a very changed institution now from what it was in the past when there was one answer for almost everybody. Um, and uh, what Egypt has at the moment, as we mentioned already, and I think everyone agrees, there is no economic plan. Egypt has a very, very high budget deficit, running maybe between 12 and 13 percent of GDP. It's running where one-third of government spending goes on subsidies, where more uh, subsidies spent on fuel subsidies than they spent on the educational budget. That is, that is unforgivable for a developing country. So what really needs to happen is not pressure from outside, and it's not happening. The IMF is waiting. They're now on their fifth, and soon will be the sixth interlocutor or finance minister in Egypt for a real economic plan that will get Egypt off um, from 2% growth back up to about 6% growth per annum that looks feasible and viable. And that's not being, um, they don't, they know, and the IMF is perfectly aware of the problems in Egypt and actually want to see answers for what the government would do about bringing down inflation, which remains above the global norm. The problems that Egypt has are internal. The problems will be surmounted by its own answers and the answers that will come from whoever's in charge. The reason why, one of the reasons why that right now people are out on the street is because the current government over the last year has done nothing about it. Food price inflation running at very high levels at mid-teens for most of the food and vegetables. So that's unsustainable. But what about the democratisation project? What about democracy installing itself in the Arab world and in, 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 and in Egypt? Do you think there is a sense, perhaps a disillusionment with that democracy is a lot harder? That it, it's, there's, no, there's no such thing as instant democracy, which... Um, is which was pushed by the West. Well, Egypt is in a revolution. It's not had a revolution yet. And if you look back over history, if you look at the Russian Revolution or the American Revolution or the French or, or anywhere else, movement and change comes and fits and starts. And that is the case in terms of Egypt right now. 
And what you saw in the last few days is another stage in its revolution. And it will be more. There will be more. And some of it may be painful. Some of it may be tough. But the fact is, it's not pleasant. Uh, global audiences are used to instant news, and they want instant answers, and they want results of things quickly. But it doesn't happen quickly. And you can't change 60 years of certain way of ruling Egypt right away. And right now, we've got the military saying to the body politic, um, you have to come together as if it's above what's happening. Well, it's also part of the problem, and it's part of the solution. But it's not going to be easy, and it means that all of the parties still have to come together. And in terms of where we are across the whole of this region, it's run in a... Uh, each country has different norms. And if you look back over history, that's been the case, the, uh, the case all over the world. But in the case of Egypt, you've all, there's been a strong government really for a long time. There was a flowering of democracy in the, uh, from the 30s to the early 50s, but it didn't progress very far. But hopefully now with the current revolution, that can happen. But it has to be an internal drive. It can't be set from outside. This is the Voice of Russia in London with me, Brendan Cole. We're discussing the protests in Egypt with Shadi Lewis. Emily Dyer, Mawa Farid, Angus Blair, and Mohammed Al Bayari. Shadi Lewis, as um, uh, Angus was saying there, it takes a long time to to get a dem- democratic system in place to get fairness and and justice for all. Do you think Egyptians really realise just how long term this is? I think they are uh, very prepared, and the uh, people in the streets now question what's democracy really. It's not only democratic pro- procedures and institutions. It's just the ability of the people to enforce the, the will on those who are ruling them. And that's what the Egyptians have done very successfully in the last two years and a half. Uh, they outstand two regimes only in two years and a half. And they are able now, more than any time, or any other people, even in the West, to outset a president elected democratically. Uh, Morsi's argument is he's elected, so he has unbreakable contract with the people for five years. Uh, however, people saying, no, we can end this contract any time we like. And they did. Mawa Farid in Cairo. What about the role of the grassroots movement, Tamarod, we've spoken about before? Is the, do they hold the key uh, to a groundswell of opposition against Morsi? Well, the main objective of Tamarod is to, uh, to remove Morsi. That, that was it. This is the main, this is the key uh, goal for them. That's the ultimate end. But what comes after that is the role of the opposition and the role of uh, other parties uh, that should be involved in the political process. So their ultimate goal might be achieved, and I'm saying might be achieved soon. I'm not sure it will be at the short term. But after that, it's really up to everyone else to decide upon. Uh, and Mohammed al Bayeria, following up on that point, I'd like to get your view. If he does step down, um, that would be uncharted territory, wouldn't it? I mean, what, what, would, what would the future hold? There are fears, certainly, this could spiral into, in, into a potential failed state in years to come. I think that the, if he was to step down, we would look at an internal situation in Egypt where it would uh, remain polarised and fragmented and, frankly, almost ungovernable. Um, on the street level for some time to come. Um, From a lot of Western perspectives, Western government's perspectives, there's going to remain stability in the relationship with the Egyptian state through the military, uh, providing security in the Suez Canal Zone, Sinai, and elsewhere. Um, So uh, that component from the outside of the country will remain solid. Uh, in the next few years, but eventually the internal discontent and fragmentation will also have an effect on the military itself and its weakening. So you want him to stay? Yes, I actually think that um, at the end of the day, they need to negotiate, both camps need to negotiate um, a a face-saving move, so to speak, um, that will put them over the next three years to the rest of Morsi's term um, towards a, a, a something they can both live with, um, but asking for an absolutist position where one camp totally succeeds in annihilating the other is just not going to work. Angus- both camps represent millions of people on mm-hmm. the on the ground. Uh, I think tomorrow is a great protest movement. Protest movements succeed to get you your, your negotiators to the table. After which point. They cannot actually 
um, deliver the result in a constructive manner. Angus Blair, your reaction to that? So they need to get to the table. They should come to the table, but the difference is there are a number of issues here. The president was elected, but that, that noted is we're in a revolution and throughout many revolutions and upsets um, over time politically, sometimes things are done beyond the constitution. And quite frankly, the president has divided the country. He's positioned, he's positioned his own people in many positions who are below par in terms of the competency. And people, quite frankly, the majority, and it does seem to be the majority, seem to be uh, not just angry by that, but really realize that they're also disappointed because people who'd supported the president historically. But one thing the opposition should learn is you cannot ignore the Muslim Brotherhood or the Islamists. You've got to keep them within the body politic to ensure that you've got in- inclusivity within uh, a future parliament. You can't uh, separate them and make people angry uh, because on this, uh, for this instance, because that's what's going to happen. And I have to say all of the political players, and that includes the military, are going to have to come together and be gentle with each other and not look for scapegoats, but to work for the betterment of the country. And that is not going to be easy. Mawa Farid, are you prepared to keep the Muslim Brotherhood within the body politic, as mentioned there? Yeah, absolutely. They are part of the uh, social fabric, social and political fabric of the Egyptian society. They have to be included in the political process. Otherwise, we are risking to have another group that is growing underground and we know nothing about and then we resurfaces and we don't know what they might do next. So they have to be, of course, included and involved. Emily Dyer, do you have any optimism that that can happen, that, that all parties, as Obama was talking about, there can be a political uh, solution to this? to this crisis. I agree with Mara. I th- I think the key mess the key difference between the opposition and the Muslim Brotherhood as we can see is that the message coming from the opposition is that if they were to uh, gain power they would ensure that they uh, laid down inclusive policies despite the polarization that included the Muslim Brotherhood that included other Islamist parties as well as secular parties um, and liberal parties. What we saw under the Muslim Brotherhood was uh, we saw a constitution that um, excluded many minorities, women, homosexuals, religious minorities, and so far they've been unwilling to make any constitutional amendments. We saw uh, President Morsi put key uh, Muslim Brotherhood figures in the key electoral districts within Egypt. We saw him reshuffle the judiciaries uh, to, and um, attempt to cream off the, the oldest members of the judiciary in order to replace them with Muslim Brotherhood members. We saw the reshuffling of Parliament where many more Muslim Brotherhood members were putting in. So I think people saw these changes and they, they could see that President Morsi was clearly trying to um, instill a, a Muslim Brotherhood stranglehold over the democratic processes. And I think that's why people are moving today. And uh, Shadi Lewis, do you think that the, the, the rights of those minorities that are mentioned there can be taken care of? Yeah, definitely. I mean, any solution now will take years and years to happen and should be an inclusive process where all people, all parties and group sit together and discuss a way forward to this country. I know it's very difficult, but it's possible. Sadly, we've run out of time. I'd just like to finish by thanking my guest, that's Shadi Lewis. He's a writer for Al Modern newspaper. Also here in the studio, Emily Dyer, a researcher from the Henry Jackson Society. On the line from Cairo, Mawa Farid, who's a pro-democracy activist and protester, also in the Egyptian capital. Angus Blair, founder of the Signet Institute, which analyzes the Middle East and North Africa. And on the line from the US, Mohammed El Biari, who is a security advisor. Thank you very much for joining me, Brendan Cole, on The Voice of Russia in London.